Hi, I'm Laurieann and I am that gal and I am with I am that guy and today we're going to be speaking about uh, boomers and Generation X and this is part one. Let me introduce you to my partner Roy. Yeah, I am that guy, Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas and uh, we're going to tell you how we see it. Perfect. So I'll let you start, Roy, because this was an idea that you came up with. Okay, so <clears throat> I am a baby boomer. Uh, I was born in 1951. I got out of high school in 1969. So uh, growing up, it was awesome when I was a kid. I mean, it was in the, in the 50s when I started school. We walked to school, walked home from school, played outside. I mean, I, I can remember... Uh, we had milk delivered to the front door. We had bread delivered to the front door. Uh, women didn't work. As a matter of fact, if if a woman was working at, in the 50s, it made her husband look bad, like he couldn't take care of his family. <clears throat> and into the 60s, things really started changing, uh, particularly about the early the early 60s. Uh, the things I remember growing up is coming home from school and as a real young kid elementary school and you would see on the news it would be all the civil rights demonstration all you know the cops beating ku klux klan all that stuff you know when i was growing up that's every every night when we got home from school that's what was on the news all night and uh then later on when it got into the 60s when that the the counterculture counter culture started then it was the vietnam war was always on there uh the hay gashbury the the flower power the hippie movement uh you know drugs in the mid to late 60s were real real prevalent uh there was a lot of the things going on people coming home from vietnam and people spitting on them and all kind of stuff so as a, as a kid those those are the things that i remember and I can remember when I was in, in uh, uh, probably, I guess I was in high school, maybe in 10th grade. And I remember coming home one time and, and, and my mom was sitting there, she shook her head, she goes, I feel so sorry for you kids for the world you're growing up in. Oh, I just, I don't know what to do, you know? And, and so, you know, which to me, I was like, what's the, what's the big deal, you know? And uh, when I was a kid, I was caught up in that. I mean, now I was never involved in drugs or anything like that, but. But I can just remember uh, in an incident when I was in elementary school, maybe the fifth grade. Yeah, I was in elementary school, either fifth or sixth grade. I came home, and I, my mother was in in, the, in there cooking dinner, but she was crying. And I went, "What's my mom?" And, and she said, "We're fixing to go to war. We're going to war. We're going to have a big war." I said, "What do you mean?" She goes, "It was the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Bay of Pigs deal." And so they thought that we were going to have you know go into war with Cuba. But anyway. Just, just things like that, that, that just little pieces uh, that I remember. But uh, growing up, to me, in the 50s and 60s was awesome. It was awesome. You know, it's not like for kids are now. We had no technology. You know, we played outside. Uh, if you if you want to know where everybody was, you just walked down the street and saw where all the bicycles were parked. That's where everybody was at that house or if they were outside, you know. Uh, and and my, I, I can remember... Uh, my friend, you know, we would leave in the morning, like ride our bicycles all day long. The rule for me was be home when the street lights come on. And there was our street keyed into another street. We all the neighborhood kids would gather down there. We'd play hide and seek and just all talk. And so you see, my parents would put the porch light on up, up off and on. That was the signal would come in the house, you know. So, I mean, it was anyway, that's kind of in a broad view of my my recollection of being a baby boomer. So so tell me about Gen X. I was I was living during Gen X. <laughs> well this is the interesting thing. The original um, age group of Gen X was 1961 to 1979. Since then they've done studies, they've changed everything and as I was telling you earlier Roy um, you know, I was born on September 23rd, and astrologically, I guess, and if anyone doesn't believe in it, I just kind of laugh about it. I'm a cuspy baby, so any one day, I don't know if I'm going to wake up as my Virgo, 
mathematical minded person or my Libra who's loving life and creative and everything and or the two combined. Same thing with the Gen X. Uh, we are kind of a lost generation of not being able to de be defined specifically. I grew up much like you. We had the porch lights going on and off, except for when I was seven, we got moved to Turkey. So uh, I grew up with four years of no television, didn't miss it at all. I've done many years without it. It doesn't bother me. Although through this COVID, I've kind of been a little bit like Netflix doing things. <laughs> but anyway, you know, been watching. There's a binging but, going on, huh? Right. But the point was, uh, having moved to Turkey, it was a whole different category. But as we were talking about earlier as well, my music is different than yours. I didn't also grow up with the Woodstock and the, ooh, we're going to be doing this. By this time, uh, you know, we, I still remember the stories about the Kennedys and them being shot, but I was like a baby, the Bay of Pigs. All I know about is the fact that it was the year I was born. And thank goodness, because I would have been not here today if that had happened, probably. I know the history of it, but it's not something that I even remember. I remember being in Turkey, the Russians being against the Americans, uh, the communist wars, uh, you know, going through Bulgaria and really kind of spooky because you wanted to make sure that people didn't think you were American, make sure you're Canadian, you put your Canadian flag everywhere. <laughs> Uh, that's what I grew up with. Again, my music was different. I think, but growing up though, again, we were all together. We didn't watch TV. We were just being busy, being busy, enjoying outside. Whereas you're exactly right. Now you've got, you know, wait a minute. Um, can I talk to you, son? <laughs> you know, and, and even when, and adults our age are just as bad. I go into yeah. a waiting room these days and they're doing this too. No one's talking to each other. So those days were awesome. I remember when I first rode my bike. I remember these things. But I will have to say, bringing up my children, we were outside a lot. We had the basketball court. We had a little court and all the kids came over. It was something my mother always said, I'd rather have your friends over here than you go somewhere else. So they were always there, it cost a lot of money on food and snacks, but that's okay. I think my biggest thing though, was when I came out of university, what a effing shocker that was, excuse my language. Because all of a sudden, all these baby boomers have my jobs. I come out with a university degree, plus a college diploma in, in uh, honors journalism, I'm going out there going, I'm going to take this world on. I'm going to get a really good job. But all the people that had the jobs already were 10 years older than me. They had all that experience. So I started as a secretary, then as an executive assistant. And then I decided the best way for me to go anywhere, start your own business. And that was, how do you get to where you want to be? And yeah, we were a little bit, um, I mean, they say, I don't believe this, the generation born after the baby boomers, roughly from the early 1960s to late 70s, typically perceived to be disaffected and directionalists. Directionalists, excuse me. Don't we say that about every generation? But the point is we did want direction. We just didn't know where to go. There were no jobs. Like there was employment, yes but they were at the lower echelon when you were coming out of university, unless you knew somebody, unless you had contacts. And my dad always said, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I told him that's not true because we are independent minded people that go, no, I can do this on my own. No, 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 it's true. If you know somebody in the dis industry, take advantage of it. it. Well, you say that because it's interesting because I worked in my career 47 years, okay? And the first four, I had no control over what I, I was directed by, you know, the school. But anyway, after that, every job I had pretty much was from somebody I knew or referred by somebody I knew. So as far as like going out and just blankly applying for a job, I never did that. 
because I'd say, hey, you know, you know anybody? Oh, yeah, go call so-and-so. Or somebody would call me, hey, why don't you come over here and work, you know? So uh, so I that that who you know, for me, that's how I'm, my whole career was, you know? Yeah. And, and it is the truth. So for anybody young out there that's listening to this or watching this, uh, don't think that it's a bad thing. I mean, my father was willing to give me some, you know, suggestions and help me with some of his contacts. And I was so stubborn. I said, no, I can do this on my own. Right, right don't. Okay. If they're offering you that gift, take it. It's a gift. <laughs> Well, one thing, uh, uh, particularly for me in the field I was in, when I when I was in that, when I first started into it, relationships were huge. There was a lot of relationship uh, in business. You know, uh, now back uh, that was in the uh, the late seventies and up into the probably the eighties, maybe mid. And after that, it got to cutthroat relationship didn't mean anything. I think from what I'm seeing now, uh, if we're talking to people that I still keep in contact with, that's kind of turning around more that relationships are seen to be making a, a comeback. And, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe maybe social media has something to do with that. But it's, just, it's starting to turn as the relationships are important in business now. Absolutely. And that's, I think, a lot of uh, really smart-minded people have actually been looking at that. They actually, in the 2017-18, there's a couple of books that were written about that, that the new generation is going to be looking for that. But I don't call it new generation either. I always believe I'm a new generation because everything I do is new. So getting on to whether you're 20 or 70, if you're getting on to this and you're going to be doing Zooms, you're a new generation. You might be older, but you're still a new generation of this. So you're absolutely right. We talked about that book about uh, the human relationships that was written. Uh, people need to, it, and, and this is what all the whole branding they talk about. I don't like the word branding. I like to say, you know, relationship building. So somebody likes you, well, they're going to like you because they're going to get to know you. They're going to see you. They're going to trust you. And that's what you want to build on. I did have just quickly, sorry, Roy, though, that we are talking about earlier too. The other thing though, that the boomers had, that the generation X really didn't. And you were right on spot on early eighties was when that all started. And that's when I started into business and, you know, mom and dad go get a university degree and, you'll get a job. Um, it's a fallacy. Uh, we have a really great radio announcer, John Derringer, that I had as a special guest once. And he said, we're feeding our children, excuse my language, but bullshit. Uh, life isn't fair. You're going to get a university degree. It's not going to guarantee you a job. Uh, again, relationships, however, will increase that opportunity to do so. In the, my dad had a job for 38 years. I saw my generation be in one of those companies and after 10 years, let go. There's, there's, there's no absolute anymore like there used to be. Except for in government. Sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, I, it's, you were talking about the degree. I can remember when I was in uh, junior high going into high school, it was, you know, most people that that I knew that were ahead of me in school, up until the, like the probably mid to late 60s, most most of those people, when they, when they got out of high school, they were going to work for the government, they were going to work for the phone company, the gas company, the light company, because they were just good, they had good benefits. Well, Vietnam started escalating so if you weren't in college, you were going to get drafted pretty much. So people started going to college more then. And everybody you talk to, what are you majored in? Business administration. What is that? I don't know. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so, I mean, there was, there was tons of business administration graduates, you know. Uh, but 
uh, and I had a friend that I grew up with, one of my close friends, and he went to college. I went to trade school, and uh, I'll never forget when I got out of trade school. He graduated from college, and I mean, he was up here. Oh man, you know, I've got my degree, and and so his degree was in American history. I said, Mark, are you going to teach? No, I don't want to be a teacher. Well, what gives American history? As long as you got a degree, that's all that matters. So for six months after he graduated, he, he went applying for jobs everywhere. And one time he went to a, a, one of the uh, newspapers, well, it's like ABC, ABC that, uh, network deal, you know, here in Dallas. So he goes in, this guy sits there, and the guy says, okay, son, why should I hire you? And he goes, well, I've got a college degree, and so is everybody else out there. Next. And I mean, he was, he was devastated. He just, he, he didn't, he, his interview sucked because he, he just thought, well, I've got a college degree. And the guy said, that don't mean nothing. What's, what else you got? And so anyway, he went to work. He ended up going to work for child welfare just to have a job. And, 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 and our whole, he's still working, but um, in our whole, I always made more money than he did. You know, I made six figures and he never did, you know. I mean, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, because he so, had the employee attitude and you ended up building your business, becoming your, owning your own business, contracting. Yeah. There's a so, difference in the mindset, right? You can be an employee that just makes the five figures your whole entire life. Yeah, and, and so, you know, I mean, in, in today's times, it's, it's probably good to have a degree, you know, but it's no yep. guarantee. And, and then you yep. think about, people going to get a degree that come out of school with hundred, two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt for student loans. I mean that's just freaking scary to me. And I, I'll say this, when my son graduated and his wife graduated, they they, they met in college but anyway, uh, he, he told me one time, he said, Dad, he said, you know when I was going to school there were so many kids there that their parents didn't do anything for them. They worked a full-time job. They paid for all the books, all the stuff. They, you know, he says, he said, you know, when I graduated and Jenny graduated, we don't have any student debt. He said, that, he's, that's huge. It is. You know. That's one thing that we did do, though. My father did do, which he actually ended up losing money on, in all fairness. <laughs> but he took an insurance for us for university that was called Universitas. So I am very, very blessed that my university was paid for. But at the time, the university fees hadn't even gone up in over the 30 years. They only started after I graduated. And by the time my children went to university, they were like $10,000 a year. I was going to university at McGill and they were still charging the same tuition as when my dad went 30 years before, like crazy. Yeah. But it's not a ticket to success. You have to be your own ticket to success. And that is, like I said, John Derringer, what he said it, he said it perfectly well. A university degree, it, it does help though. I mean, it does help a lot of people with their self-confidence, their knowledge, their ability to learn, absolutely. But it's not your ticket to a job. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's, it's really, it's just, it's just another way to sort people out. So they've got 10,000, you know, 500 people applying. They got, well, these 400 don't have degrees. So there's their trash. Yep. I mean, it's, just, it's just a culling process. It's just one more step. If, if you don't have it, we don't want you. Yeah, so. So it does give you an edge. Absolutely. I'm not saying that, yeah. but it was, like I said, my parents get a university degree. You're going to get a job, uh, the job that you want, your dream job. Well, they didn't say it quite like that, but that's pretty well what you think of. You know, we, we, brought, we were brought up in Disney World, too, though, don't forget. <laughs> like, you know, Cinderella and, the, you know, the happily ever after. I do have to come back to you for one quick, quick thing that you said earlier with you being brought up as a boomer. Um, it's, uh, by the way, the ones before the boomers I looked up, they're called the silent generation. <laughs> uh, it, sure was, it sure wasn't the... Uh... It says silent. <laughs> the greatest. I thought it was the people that were like in before 1946. Were they the greatest generation or something? But anyway, go ahead. there's two. There's two terms: the greatest and the silent. 
Okay, yeah, the greatest is always one I always heard. Yeah, and my grandfather, I remember talking to him when I was, uh, I was really pissed at him because we were brought up feminists. That's one thing that the Generation X did bring with us, although it had calmed down a bit, you know, the Maryland uh, Frenches out there and so on were a little bit calmer by the time I got to my age uh, of understanding. But we were still independent. Our parents brought us up. Women need to have their independence. But my grandfather said to me, and I was pissed at him at the time, but I get it. He said, women should never have gone out to work. Understanding this, it's not necessarily women but one person in the household should stay home with the children because what happened is when women went out to work, they increased the toxins so that the dual family income had to stay dual family because the taxes, the more like, look at her. It's really hard for anybody now for any woman to stay home and care for children and their spouse to be out there and earning all the money because what was supposed to be stopped after world war one which is called taxes kept increasing and the government and i'm sorry because people are not going to like me for this but my grandfather was right he said the government took advantage of the fact that women went out to work and now they have two incomes to tax not just one well it, let, let me just all right, when I was a kid, like five, when I started school, five, six, seven years old, we had a two bedroom house. I had, a bro I, I had a brother and three sisters. We all slept in the same room. The door, we had to, my sisters had a, a, a full size bed, and my brother and I had a twin. We had to climb over their bed to get to, to ours. And I mean, one bathroom, uh, small house, I mean, rinky dink house, okay? And and I can remember when we moved to another house, had three bedrooms, we were like, oh my gosh, look at this. And we had uh, we had uh, central heat, we didn't have air, central air, we had uh, window units. Then my parents in the, in the mid 60s, they built the house and it was like three bedrooms, two baths, two car garage, fireplace. And we were like, oh man, we're, we're, we're Big time now, you know, and and so <laughs> and so. Uh, but I can remember as a kid, you know, and, and and in my opinion, not not necessarily women going to work, but in the fifties growing up, the mom stayed home. You know, you, you know, she was there all the time. And even in the sixties, we came home from school, we did homework, we had dinner, all of us together. You know, so the family unit was always there. In my, in, I think a lot of our problems today is that breakup of the family unit because now then, you know, a lot of parents are like, here, here's some money, go. They, you know, they, they're more interested in what they want to do for their themselves than spending time with the kids and trying to, you know, here, here's buy, here's a computer, here's a phone entertain yourself i'm busy i've got you know you know what i mean and it wasn't that way growing up so i think i think that if more people no phones at the dinner table we sat down and eat you know have dinner we talk you know we need more in my opinion more of that oh we do but i'll i'll interject on that one in regards to the parents are doing what they want to do i don't agree with that one thousand percent or 100% or whatever, because what I was telling you is it's very difficult for a family. Like I had three children. It was very expensive to bring them up. We know we're going to be putting them in university. They're taxing us to death. My, my ex and I, we were starting a business. So I had to work too. We were, that was the point. Uh, we worked extra hours. We did spend a lot of time outside with our children and we did, and we took them places and we put bathtubs with bubbles and stuff like that. Probably not as much as we should have. Point is, if it was capable, if the taxes weren't so high as far as I'm concerned, because that's what happened, the government found that there were two incomes now, let's increase the taxes. Both people have to keep working in order to 
have a decent living. Uh, and so it, it's not even a desire to do it. It's a have to do. Mm -hmm. But what you were saying is even if it was the fathers, because there's a lot of dads now that are really taking, I love that part. Like I love this new generation where you see dads walking their, their kids in strollers. It's not just all moms. They're taking more part with their children because that was an issue in the fifties. Dad went there. Mommy did all this. Now there's more of that bonding, but it would still be lovely if we could actually afford to have one person home, uh, to be able to, to, to do what our mothers did, but it doesn't have to be a mother. It could be a father. Right. But again, the tax base is just too high. And this COVID, I'm sorry, but as much as it's horrifying, it's also been a blessing in a kind of way. I mean, can you imagine? And, and to me, I'm sorry, but like my children are grown up and I can't see them because they're everywhere else and because of COVID. But I'm even excited about being home for my dogs. They like, cause I go out to work. <laughs> like They're excited to have me home. I, I kind of horrifyingly say, and I don't mean this in any disrespect to COVID or people out there hurting with it, but sometimes I wish it would have happened while my children were young because it would have actually been able to give me a time. I was unemployed after I lost my job and my ex-husband, we, we separated. It was the best summer ever. I was unemployed. I spent every day with my children, cooked for them, did everything. I can't say that there was any other summer that I've had such a beautiful time. Well, you know, just a little, let me, let me veer off to the side here for a little bit. Sure. So, so what I, my, I always thought, well, I've got to work. I've got to, you know, and I, you take care of the kids, you take care of the kids. That was, that was my mentality. Okay. You deal with the kids, I'll work. And I mean, I was working day and night. I was always working. So, uh, so my wife says one day, she goes, you know, when you leave, the kids are asleep. When you come home, the kids are asleep. And if you are ever off, you're, you're too tired, you want to mess with them. And she said, if you're not careful, they're going to grow up and not know who you are. And, you know, and I thought, wow, boy, that kind of hit me, you know, kind of hard. And so, uh, due to some circumstances, so I ended up selling my half of this company out on. And uh, I went to the attorney on July the 1st, I'll never forget it, signed the papers, walked out the door. And when I walked out the door, it was like a weight that being lifted off of me. I mean, I, I can't tell you, I didn't have a job, nothing, but I can't tell you how freeing that was. So I went home and I told the kids, I said, look, if y'all will help me around the house for a couple of weeks, because I didn't I mean, I was always working, I didn't take care of nothing. If y'all will help me get the stuff mom wants done, then the rest of the summer will do whatever y'all want to do. Go school park. Well, Chip, can we go swimming? Yeah, can we go six flags? Yeah, I can go skate. Whatever. Whatever y'all want to do, we'll do. So sure enough, for about a week and a half or so, we did stuff. So then I said, okay, what do y'all want to do tomorrow? Well, can we go bowling? Yeah, let's go. So so they were like in elementary school. So anyway, so, so until they went back to school, that's what we did. Whatever they wanted to do, we did. My wife was still working, and so and she was okay with it because I was getting that relationship with the kids, right? So the kids go back to school because I told her I said, "Look, I want to take some time off." You know, she was okay, whatever. So when the kids went back to school, I became the Mr. Mom. I was going to the grocery store. Stand in line with all the with all the housewives with the coupons and and then I would you know run all the errands and do all this stuff and so it, when Barbara would come home from work because she got off at four so she'd come home from work I'd have dinner ready and you know by the and so so we'd eat dinner and you know like by five o'clock everything was done I mean it was like free for the night right so the people she worked with they go does it bother you that your husband's not working? She goes, are you kidding? Hey, I, I'm, not, I'm not being a man. I come home, I have to do anything. I love it. He does all the stuff. He does the house. He does, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so anyway, we get a, I used to get a lot of kidding about that. 
her. But so, uh, uh, but, you know, women do a lot. And they do, they do more than men. I'm, I'm, they, I'll raise my hand. And my wife used to, for 10 years, she worked all day. She would come home, get the kids. One had soccer practice on Monday and Wednesday. And one had Tuesday and Thursday. She would fight rush hour traffic to go an hour across town for them to practice for a couple hours. Sit there while they were practicing. She would go through the drive through because my kids didn't, if it didn't come in a white sack, she would drive through. They didn't know what it was. They could, they'd be starving. So if they would, they would eat dinner in the car coming home. They'd come home, do the homework, go to bed. I mean, for 10 years, she did that. 10 years. And uh, in the summertime, for those 10 years, my, my boys were in Boy Scouts. And so in, in one week of every summer, I would take them to, to Boy Scout camp. And then she would take my oldest son, he was in uh, competitive soccer, so she would take him to regional playoffs, out of state. So, I mean, that was our life for 10 years you know, while the kids were growing up, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't regret any of it. I wouldn't pay for it. Uh, my youngest son, I went on a 60 mile backpacking trip with him. And when he was 14, and it almost killed me, but I did it, uh, and I loved. I mean, I, I it's one of my most cherished memories, you know. Well, it's like that song, right? The cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, exactly. right? That, that, I, that song hit me pretty hard. And by the way, I do know that song, Cat Stevens. <laughs> I absolutely adore him. <laughs> so yes, I did. There are some of the you know '60s songs that I do really listen to a lot. And we do have our different generations. My kids love the Rolling Stones. I wasn't a big hit person for them at that time. Um, but but like I was telling you too, though, it was a bit of a generation apart. Uh, I know that there were a lot more jobs available to move up in. By the time we came, it was saturated by the boomers. Uh, I'm possibly considered a boomer, but I'm like the tail end of it but the original was 61. I actually believe that I did have struggles, but I started my own business. That's what I did. I thought, you know what? I worked, but I also started my own business on the side because I figured this is where it is. And I'm still doing that. So before we go, <laughs> let me let me give you, this is called What Events Shaped the Baby, Baby Boomers Personality, okay? In 1954, the McCarthy hearings began. I can remember hearing that on TV. Uh, 1955, Rosa Parks refuses to move to the back of the bus. That was in back in the civil rights stuff. Uh, 1957, the first nuclear power plant. 1960, Kennedy elected president. And I can remember what a big deal that was back, back in those, when I was a kid. Uh, the 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember that well. Uh, 1963, Martin Luther King leads the march on Washington. I remember that. Uh, 1963, President John Kennedy assassinated. Uh, I was in the seventh grade. And we had a split period for lunch. And it was a math class. We went to lunch and came back. And our teacher was said, crying. And Mrs. Poole, what's the matter? She said, the president's been shot. You know, because we're like, what? And so anyway, they sent us home you know, from school. Uh, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. In 1965, the U.S. sends ground troops to Vietnam. Uh, 1966, the National Organization for Women was founded. Now, uh, 1960, yeah. 1967, the American Indian, Indian Movement was founded. 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Also, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Remember that. 1969, the first moon landing. And I can remember that well because it was the day after my birthday. And I was over at my now wife, the then girlfriend's house, uh, <laughs> watching that. And then the Kent State University shootings. I remember that. And, and speaking of uh, the moon landing, I remember in the 50s, Sputnik, the Russian Sputnik. You know, that was, a, I can remember that. That was a big, that was a big deal. But 
But anyway, that's just some faint events that, you know, happened for the boomers, you know, kind of milestone events. You know, I thought that was pretty interesting. And out of those, I very, very, very have limited knowledge of Robert Kennedy because it was 68, so I would have been six years old. Um, and the landing in the moon, um, I would have been seven. So, and we were heading over to Turkey at the time that that was happening. But those are the only two I can. Again, there you go. Like there's a huge difference on that front. Um, but I do remember some other things that I've done, you know, in the 19, 1983 was when I had my first computer a lot of people didn't want computers, but mine was an EX Tandy with no hard drive, plugged in a 300 baud, and I was one of the first people to go out there on the BBS. And at the time, only 10% of women were on computers. I can remember, I can remember my best friend, we'd go up, there was a radio shack, and there's this shop <laughs> and We went in there, and he's was showing this computer. You know, you remember, they were big, and and then the, the modem, you, you put your phone receiver in, you know, yep. and he was trying to explain to me how it worked and what it was. And then you're talking about the PBS. That's like in the 90s, right? No, 80s. The 80s? Yeah, the PBS. And you had the green screen mm -hmm. and you could actually type to people all over the world. You could find something that you were interested in. It was pretty well the first messenger ever was a PBS. And 300 broad was really slow. When it got to 1200, uh, I was really super excited and my dad was with Nortel so he knew all the technology that was going to be coming out and he goes you got to get that really expensive my first computer was three thousand dollars and like I said it didn't have a hard drive <laughs> like, yeah. It's like... <laughs> it, yeah it was it, it, I can remember and and the BBS back in those days that's kind of where online marketing started yeah I, mean, I can remember they were talking about oh man you can download a book you know, you can do this, you know, it was like, write a, a book, and, you know, it, that was, I remember that was a big deal. Uh, I remember seeing that. The 1990s, the early 1990s, CompuServe was really ahead of themselves, like, that was where we first went on, uh, and we could actually download, you know, download, <laughs> download, it took forever, <laughs> but, we, it was exciting, and then they moved on. The internet came out in 90, I think, really came out in 1993, because it was the year my daughter was born. And again, like, it was nice back then. I wish that I could find an underground, just quickly, and this is a little bit of an aside, but I wish I could find an underground internet that was the equivalent of 1993, where there was no pornography. Literally, pornography had not in intervened in the, all this crap at this point. And the people that you spoke to, they were genuine and and it was like it was a, a cleaner internet so to speak if i don't mind me saying that i miss those days and i used to joke around about actually setting up an underground so that whatever that internet little bubble was had nothing to do with the whole internet that's out there today i miss it but it is what it is it becomes commercial it becomes what it is you know yeah but you're talking about the the green screen because I, yeah. I, I worked in a lot of office buildings. You know, you had the, the the green letters. Then all of a sudden, the orange ones came out. Like, yes. Oh, oh wow! Look at this. And uh, then you couldn't uh, leave your screen on for too long, or else it would actually burn into the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and then uh, and then I can remember the like, uh, oh, what was the word processor? Uh, Oh gosh, a one word processing platform. I can't uh dang what was it? anyway. Well, there was star there was star No, this this was like everybody had it. Anyway, and then there was uh, the uh, and the Wang. Wang was a big deal in the eighties, you know, Wang this, Wang that. I don't know. Anyway, it's just it's amazing how how the technology changed. You know, I can remember what I thought talking about a three thousand dollar computer i had a 286 and then not so after i bought it the 386 that came out like, oh wow i know I wish i would have waited <laughs> now i actually okay so when we do part two i'm going to bring out i have every issue of the net which were magazines that came out 
back in 19, oh my goodness. It had to be in like the early 90s and I have every single one of them with the CDs. And I sometimes go back just to find out if some of those things that they recommended to go to are still there. Some of them are. Like yeah. there used to be the avatars on World and then there was the palace and those still actually exist. And I'm going, I guess I used to spend so much time having fun going from room to room and, you know, introducing myself to people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And that's when you have the avatar, by the way, the avatar, right? That is just a computer generated version of what you are. You are a human being. <laughs> I know, you know, I don't like the avatar thing when it comes to business. Your don't target mention, market, the person you want to love. <laughs> don't mention Avatar to Lorianne. <laughs> so, All right. But before That's we get awesome. to so next our our part two, we're gonna be talking about Lorianne's or Net, but I've got I've got something I'm just gonna call it perspective. And it's gonna uh, have you look back at people before they were baby boomers and what they went through to get to the baby boomer generation. It's, it's really very interesting, I think. I think everybody will like it. So, you know, look, look for part two, look for part two. That's excellent. I can probably help you out with that too because I hear a lot about that with my mother talking about her parents, what they had to go through. So that's kind of neat, the depression. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, so guys, it's been wonderful. I'm Laurieann, I'm from Milton, Ontario. I am that gal and I am with I am Roy Miller. I'm that guy from Dallas, Texas. And thank y'all for listening. We appreciate it. And be sure and catch part two. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye.